Things sure have changed, haven't they? Things have definitely changed out there in the world as far as how we use our devices, how we access information. In fact, I just did a presentation this morning for Cisco Systems themselves, and it was on the Carrier Routing System 3, the CRS3 system that they have for large service provider environments. And one of the fascinating things about uh, that presentation was I talked this morning about how there will be a predicted 600, no, 6,000, that's right, 6,000% increase in mobile traffic, in Wi-Fi and 3G and 4G traffic, what we call mobility traffic, a 6 thousand percent increase in that traffic through like 2013. So Wi-Fi being a chunk of that is more important than ever. In fact, to give us his take on the changing world that we have in networking right now, I'd like to bring in one of our guest experts from the field. His name is Jeff Hardy, and here he is to talk to us about how our world is changing. Wireless has been one of those gotta-have technologies. Although wired speeds have been faster than wireless since wireless was introduced, the value of wireless has been clear from the start, and engineers continue to up the speed and distance a wireless signal can go to match or exceed LAN speeds. Remember when an internet connection at a coffee shop was a novelty? Now some whole cities are offering free wireless to residents who can't afford broadband. Yet, as much as users want the ability to roam, it's important to understand that the wireless infrastructure is simply another component on the network with its own challenges for installation, configuration, and security. At every company I've worked at, wireless has been a huge concern for the IT department. The data path of a wireless device eventually crosses onto the wired network. The security issues with wireless have often relegated it to serving as only a secondary or guest network with minimal support. Yet I have performed work at some companies where wireless was the main network. When it went down, it was a major issue. The majority of problems I've encountered with wireless involve things like encryption not being configured correctly, or incompatibilities with encryption on hosts, DHCP on access points running out of addresses, or misunderstandings, we'll say, about the limits of the wireless signal. Great stuff. You know, one of the things we obviously have to do as we start to look at wireless local area networks is we want to compare them to our traditional networks, the wired networks that we've been talking about. Obviously, one of the first comparison points that jumps out at you is the wires are gone, of course. So we're going to use radio frequency transmissions, radio waves, instead of the physical, traditional physical cabling. It's an obvious, obvious difference. But another kind of subtle difference behind the scenes that's pretty interesting is we are no longer in the wireless LAN going to use that multiple access carrier sense uh, collision detection. We know in our Ethernet lands that we've been talking about, we've been doing that CSMA CD. CD, of course, standing for collision detection. Now what we're going to be doing is CA, collision avoidance. Carrier sense, multiple access, collision avoidance. So we're going to be doing that as a replacement technology. Now, what's interesting about this is this is going back kind of old school, isn't it? Yeah, this is going back to how token ring infrastructures worked using the collision avoidance type technique instead of the collision detection. Also, another interesting thing is we know in our wired infrastructure, we like to have our switches and we like to micro segment the network and that allows us to do a full duplex communication, a collision free. That's not what happens in the wireless local area network. We are back to a half duplex type of communications and collisions are very much a part of the wireless LAN infrastructure. Also, because we're wireless, we have a whole host of challenges that we're not used to. 
like interference, problems with structures between our devices like metal filing cabinets and things like that that cause reception problems. We're not used to dealing with that in our traditional wired infrastructures. And everyone always gets a little nervous about privacy issues since it would be much easier for someone to tap into these communications. Our access points in our wireless LAN infrastructure are gonna be a lot similar to like ethernet hubs. So we are kind of going a step backwards in that regard with this particular technology. And finally, a key, key difference here is the fact that we have to meet our countries or the country we're operating in, we have to meet that country's specifications for how the radio frequencies can be used. So we're not on our own like we are when we're in the local area network, you know, building a network however we want. Here we have to meet regulatory requirements in the country that we're building our wireless local area network. So we're using radio frequencies instead of the traditional wires in order to move our data. And we've got to watch out for all kinds of potential interference problems. And you can see our graphics department really had a lot of fun with this particular graphic. Yeah, reflection, scattering, absorption. These are all problems that can affect your wireless LAN infrastructure. I was on a consulting engagement here in Tampa, Florida, and it was amazing the problems that we had with 802.11G wireless between two of the devices in this infrastructure. Everything else was working just great. It turned out the building materials that were in this one wall, the special building materials in this one wall were enough to almost completely kill our ability to do wireless in that particular area. So we do have a whole set of concerns when it comes to wireless LANs that we really don't have in the traditional wired infrastructure. Now, I need you to memorize for purposes of CCNA certification, I need you to memorize three organizations that we turn for assistance with standards when it comes to our wireless LANs. First of all, you can see here the ITU-R. The ITU-R is responsible for regulating the radio frequency bands, right? Who can use what portion of the radio frequency band for what? So the ITU-R is going to res be responsible for who gets what use of that spectrum. Again, this might be great information to put on your flashcards because, as I said, this information is going to be required to be memorized for our Cisco Certified Entry Networking Technician, or CCENT, certification. Now, how about the next organization, the next standards body? Well, the next standards body that we have, as you can see, is the IEEE. The IEEE is the one we kind of think about all the time when we think about wireless standards. They're making those standards like 802.11a, 802.11b, 802.11g, and the latest, greatest standard, 802.11n. The 802.11n is in NANCY standard, expands how far these signals can travel, and it expands on the data transmission rates that are possible with wireless networking. So the 802.11 committee in the IEEE is the one that's bringing us these wired, uh, wireless standards that we get so excited about. And finally, the third organization that I want you to memorize is the Wi-Fi Alliance. Now, what the Wi-Fi Alliance is all about, and here's their logo, and I asked our graphics department to put their logo here for a very specific reason. The Wi-Fi Alliance logo you look for when you're purchasing your wireless stuff, you're purchasing your network cards, your access points, your laptop with a wireless transceiver built in, you're looking for this Wi-Fi Alliance logo. Why? 
Well, you're looking for the logo because if the stuff that you're purchasing features that logo, you have their guarantee that it's going to all work together. Now, it's not like you can sue them or something if it doesn't work together, but the idea behind this is if it bears this Wi-Fi Alliance logo, it is following the standards that have been put forth by these other organizations and the multi-vendor equipment should work together beautifully in the wireless infrastructure. So, pretty cool. And again, please go ahead and commit these organizations to memory. What's the name of the organization? What is the organization responsible for? So, the wireless, you can see, lives in a band of the total radio frequency spectrum that's available called the ISM bands. The ISM band is the industrial, scientific, and medical band. So the ISM band is where our wireless lives. We have the 2.4 gigahertz band inside this overall band, and you can see it is a key key technology that's used in the most popular, uh, popular wireless LAN standards of today. What are those? Well, 802.11b, as in boy, and 802.11g. Those are our most popular standards in use out there today. Obviously, more and more, we are seeing 802.11n devices, and they also can operate in that 2.4 gigahertz band. It's really quite interesting, folks, when you look at these technologies, because they will use differing underlying technologies in order to increase the reach and the speeds of the wireless transmissions. Look at this. If you go back to the old 802.11b, that technology used something called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And I don't know why I memorized that, uh, when I became a CCNA in wireless, I ended up memorizing some of these terms, I guess, and they never left my head. But it uses this OFDM technology, but it can only get a theoretical maximum transmission rate of 11 megabits per second. I said theoretical transmission rate because we're never going to get a true 11 megabits per second with that technology. Hopefully, we'll get pretty close, but if you actually get 11 megs per second on an 802.11b wireless network, run right out and play the lottery because you are the luckiest person on the planet. Think about all the things like interference and everything that could come into play so that you don't get that true level of bandwidth. With 802.11a, we get speeds up to 54 megabits per second. With 802.11g, it uses dense spectrum. Uh, I actually forget what that one stands for, thank goodness. But it uses a DSSS technology. And again, we can hit that theoretical 54 megabit per second number. Let me explain something to you too here that's very, very important for you to realize about these technologies. You can go out and you can get a bunch of 802.11G equipment and it is backwards compatible with the 802.11B stuff. But if you run it that way, it's called mixed mode. If you run it that way, you will not be able to get these higher speeds. So when you're looking at wireless local area networking, maybe you can get a bunch of 802.11G equipment at a real nice price now. Just realize that if you run it in that mixed mode so that it can support the 802.11B stuff, you are going to sacrifice the speed at which it operates. As a matter of fact, that's the same exact thing for our 802.11N equipment. The 802.11n equipment can get some really, really blazing speeds. Notice we can get up to 150 megabits per second, theoretically, if we're using the 5 gigahertz band. But 
it's only going to operate at such a high speed if you put it in a mode where it's not compatible with 802.11b or G clients. So definitely consider that as you're planning your wireless local area networks and you're purchasing that equipment. One last little commercial here, I suppose you could call it, for the Wi-Fi Alliance. Again, that Wi-Fi Alliance is going to try and make sure that the stuff that you are purchasing for your wireless local area network is all going to play together nicely. Now, a lot of students get a little concerned in the area of wireless. They say, well, what's the kind of stuff that I'm going to be required to know in the certification exam in this regard? And let me go ahead and present to you right now a sample certification exam question on wireless LANs. What approach is used for media access in the wireless LAN? Is it carrier sense multiple access collision detection? Is it carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance? Is it carrier sense multiple access closed captioned? I guess that would stand for. Uh, that uh, is a totally made up option there, number C. So it cannot be option C, or none of these options are correct. Well, we know from our study of wireless here that it's actually going old school on us, isn't it? It is going carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance.